Want to learn more about how you can help the marketplace of ideas reach 10,000 podcast subscribers in 2011 and thus make it into 2012? You can subscribe to the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list by sending me your preferred email address at colin at colinmarshallradio.com. That is colin, C-O-L-I-N, at colinmarshallradio.com. Thanks. Today it's a conversation with cultural journalist Saul Austerlitz, author of Another Fine Mess, A History of American Film Comedy on the Marketplace of Ideas, Cultural Conversation of the Depth You Demand. It's the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm your man of letters and sound waves, Colin Marshall. Saul Austerlitz has been a writer, a critic in many publications. He's the author of Money for Nothing, A History of the Music Video. And now he's the author of the even more ambitious Another Fine Mess, A History of American Film Comedy. Now, Saul, I have to tell you, this is one of the few books that I have read out of order because I had to first go to the chapter on Bill Murray, who for me represents sort of what I like best about what modern American comedy has become. And you discuss in the chapter on him, there's a moment in Wes Anderson's Rushmore, one of my very favorite films as well, and many people's favorite, that that defines sort of his change from one type of comedy to another, his conversion moment, maybe. What, what did he convert from and to? Well, when you look at Bill Murray's earlier film, you see that he's this wonderfully lovable wise ass, basically. <laughs> um, you know, he's someone who's brilliant at conveying this sense of not really caring about what anyone thinks or what anyone says. And he has this marvelous way of floating above the films that he's in. He's sort of commenting on them, making fun of them at the same time that he's actually in them. Uh, and the amazing thing that happens in Rushmore and, and a little bit before it as well in the film Groundhog Day is that you see that Murray slows down a bit. He becomes more real. There's a sense of sort of hard-fought wisdom that comes out in these roles, a sense that he's he's weighed down by life in a way that those previous roles had never really conveyed. Uh, he becomes an actor, really, in a way that he had never truly been before. And Bill Murray is just one of the many chapters in the book. I mean, you go from Charlie Chaplin to Judd Apatow. And when you're researching a guy like Bill Murray, who's had this kind of change in his career, in his style, how how deep do you go? I mean, does it is it simply, or I guess this isn't so simple, but close watchings of all his performances? Or do you did you want to dig a little deeper and try to see what you could do to find a cause for this shift? Or what materials, I suppose, did you consider fair game for these individual histories? Yeah, it's definitely a combination of the two. I think that my first resource is always going to be close watching of the film. Um, you know, I'm writing, even in the sense of writing sort of biographical chapters about these great performers and great directors, um, the, the sense of the biography that I'm interested in is rooted in the films themselves and the work that they did. So I'm always interested in the lives, but mostly in the ways in which the lives intersect with the works. Um, so for me, anything is really fair game. You know, I'll always look at biographies or magazine or newspaper profiles um, or really anything else that would give me some sense of, of the actual people. But in the kind of work that I'm interested in doing, it, it always has to be rooted in the films because that to me is what is what lasts. You know, and it's, it's what, you know, when we talk about the person named Bill Murray, in a lot of ways we're talking about the characters he plays and not really about the real person who none of us actually know in any way. Given that, what can we say about the motivations is a loaded word here, but the reasons for this change of his? It's hard to say, really. Um, I don't know if, if there was would be one reason in particular that I would point to. I think that, to some extent, it's a product of the circumstance of working with 
um, that that alone manages to convey some sense of, of humanity uh, that I think a lot of other you know, first-year performers sort of lack. As Anthony Lane wrote in his review of Rushmore, which I'm sure you've read at some point or another, how on earth did this guy become a movie star? How does the same industry employ him and a guy like Brad Pitt? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, there's something, I think that one of the things that people connect with so deeply about Bill Murray is that sense in which he is so unlikely a figure to have taken up this psychic space uh, in American culture or, you know, in the American film. He just doesn't fit in some ways. And if I can get so grand this early, it occurred to me that when you look at Bill Murray and look at the sort of the sort of shift in sensibility we've been talking about, it does seem to reflect something, a development that I've liked in American comedy. And in some ways, I consider Rushmore to be one of the first points where I came around to really consider myself a fan of American comedy because it became, it became to me comedy that was not so outwardly comedic. There was more perhaps nuance there and and more a wider range of emotion of which the the laughter only took a little bit of precedence. Do you know what I mean? Has there actually been more of that in American comedy in recent years? Or is this just something I seem to see perhaps because of who I watch? Or is this an actual actual way things are going? I think there is some more of it than there has been. But I, I would also say that, you know, the American comedy, like any other cultural form you know, goes in cycles, and each wave sort of, uh, there are often recurring themes. So I would say that, you know, this sense of of the kind of comedy that you're describing is definitely something that exists now, and and Rushmore, I think, is a terrific example of it. But I would say that, you know, if you look at some of the comedies being made in the 1930s or 40s, or definitely some of the comedies being made in the American New Wave in the 1970s, you'll see something similar with movies where, you sort of end up scratching your head and asking yourself, you know, am I supposed to laugh now? (laughs) It's like unclear what is and isn't funny. And that in some ways adds to the humor, I think. It is a feeling I love. And just so, so we're clear then there are, you you found a few peaks of this in the history of American film comedy. We might be at one of them, but there are a few more before. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what's, what I suppose, what are the, what are the richest points of that? I mean, I'm, I'm not going to assume... Well, you can tell me which, which the peaks of specifically what you find interesting in American film comedy. But I mean, what are, what are the, really, the really richest eras for you in terms of what you are researching, in terms of what you like to watch? Given, given what we said, there's got to be specific times that were just very good for, very good for high-quality comedy in America. Yeah, there definitely were. You know, I think when you look at the... Um the earliest era, which is the, you know, the silent era. Um, it, it's unquestionably a peak in American comedy. Um, you know, we're talking about the era from 1914 to 1927 when the jazz singer comes out and effectively puts an end to silent filmmaking. You know, you have performers like Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton and Harold Lloyd and the early work that Laurel and Hardy do. And it's just such a remarkable, uh, deep, group of films that um, in some ways it's almost like the American film comedy starts off with its best work. Um, And and I think that a lot of people have mistaken assumptions about silent films and silent comedy in particular, that it's old or hackneyed or not particularly funny or amusing. And what's remarkable to me about those films is how little explanation they require, how little, uh, in a sense, apologizing they need in order for audiences to appreciate them. Um, So that, to me, is definitely one of the major peaks of American comedy. And the other is, uh, I would say, the 1930s to early 1940s, you know, the era of screwball comedy of uh, Preston Sturgis and Ernst Lubitsch and the movies that Cary Grant and Catherine Hepburn do together and apart. Uh, You know, it's just a remarkable flowering of incredibly witty, incredibly fast, uh, just brilliantly done comedy work. So those, those to me are definitely uh, two of the peaks. And I would say that, you know, a, a lot of the recent work that's been done has been very impressive as well. I'd, I wouldn't say it's quite at the same level, but, you know, just some of the stuff that's happened in the last 15 or 20 years 
you know, ranging from these late Bill Murray films to what Wes Anderson has been doing to some of the Coen Brothers comedies or, you know, Will Ferrell or Ben Stiller. There's been a, a tremendous amount of, of terrific comedy work happening in American filmmaking in, in recent times. It is something I hear a lot, especially in stand-up comedy circles, but also in comedy f- film circles, although those I've found overlapping a lot recently, which is that we're in another we're in another great boom of comedy right now because of guys like, as you mentioned, Will Ferrell or, or because of Judd Apatow, the final chapter in your book, or because of just this whole, this whole circle of, of very prolific filmmakers and comedians that have been working together. You know, this gets, this, this gets thought of by specifically comedy fans, people who are into comedy, for whom comedy is their sort of field of geekdom. They call it a golden age of comedy right now, but what's your take on that? I would agree to some extent. The only complicating factor for me is just in in the sense that a lot of the great comedy work that's happening right now, or at least the comedy work that I enjoy the most, is happening on television also. Mm. You know, so whereas in an era, in some of the previous eras that I was talking about, essentially all the great performers would have flocked to film. Uh, You have people now like Tina Fey or um, shows like Louie, or Community, which I think are wonderful examples of some of the brilliant cutting-edge comedy happening right now, and they're happening on TV. It doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of great work happening in film. You know, all the people you just mentioned are definitely exemplars of that. But it's interesting to me how the world of comedy has sort of split in some senses, that it's not all going to be found at the local multiplex. A lot of it is going to be on TV. And in some ways, uh, what's happening on TV is almost more cutting edge in some ways. You know, if you look at a show like Community, it gets away with some really daring things that most mainstream film comedies, you know, with the exception of people like Apatow, don't really manage to accomplish. Yes, if there's one group that's that's more vocal about their appreciation than the comedy fans saying now is the time for comedy, it's the television fans saying now is the time for television. And I'm thinking a little bit about this split, this these two media splitting from one another in terms of there not being a lot of exchange between them. I've, I've heard that, for example, you mentioned Tina Fey. People very much appreciate her on television, but when she's appeared in films, it's been some time, or more, more so when she's written for film, it's been more successful than her appearances in films, from what I've heard. And it seems like the era of a comedian or a comedic actor or whatever you want to call them who can jump between media and do all sorts of things isn't really happening right now that if someone's successful in one medium, they kind of stick to it. And assuming that that's true, what what is specifically American film comedy becoming if, it, if it's sort of branching off into its own ecosystem? What qualities, what qualities is it taking on if TV has taken away a certain, a certain type of performer or writer? What is film then left to work with and sort of make its own? Well, it's an interesting question. I think in particular because of, the, because of Tina Fey, who in some ways I see as being the potential counter example to what is the dominant trend in contemporary comedy film. Mm. You know, I, I look at Apatow, who I think is, is just brilliant, um, but who has a tremendous amount of imitators, not all of whom can do what he can do. And, you know, I would describe what they do as being a kind of guy comedy. You know, it's, it's comedies for and about guys, uh, you know, not to be confused with men or boys, uh, guys being this sort of eternally youthful, sex-obsessed, you know, not particularly uh, career-driven uh, set of 20-something, 30-something people who seem to enjoy hanging out with each other more than <laughs> anything else. Uh, so he's, he's, Apatow in particular, is tremendously gifted at writing for that male voice. Uh, and I think he manages to brilliantly convey it. And I think that he also manages to do it in a nuanced way. But I think that some of his imitators don't. And what they've ended up with is this sort of raunchy, often funny, but not very subtle uh, style of comedy that really leaves women out. You know, cast women in the roles of wives and girlfriends, kind of nagging uh, sidekicks. And there's not really a sense in which these movies allow women to be funny. And one of the things 
one of the reasons why I hope that Tina Fey does become a movie star and does manage to uh, translate what she's done on television into film is because I think that she can can provide some um, can counteract some of that trend, which I think is a, a complicated one, and um, you know doesn't necessarily speak well to some of these writers and directors and performers. You know, kind of abilities to create a more nuanced world. I'm glad you mentioned the Apatow imitators because, of course, when you're living through the peak of any of any creator's career, they're going to have a lot of people imitating them and leaving detritus all over, and it can be hard hard sometimes to tell the the genuine product from the from the nonsense before you actually have to go and see it, and it's too late. And I wonder. Is that an argument to focus more on the comedies of earlier eras? I mean, when you're watching the comedies of the silent era or from the 40s or even from the 70s, is it true that there's a a filtering effect that can work in your favor? Like what's survived is not going to be the detritus. So you're going to get a richer experience if you if you apply that sort of time filter by going back in time a bit? Undoubtedly. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also clear who the people are who it makes sense to focus on. You know, so when you're writing about the silent era, there's not going to be much argument from anyone that if you're writing about Chaplin and Keaton and Lloyd, that those are the people to write about. Whereas, you know, picking the comedic figures of the past 20 years who are relevant and who hopefully will still be relevant 20 years from now uh, is a trickier task and it's one that seems to be more likely to cause to cause people to disagree. You know, so in, in talking to people about this book, a lot of people has, have been especially adamant about Apatow. They either love him and love his work, or they're horrified that he's even included in the book and just don't understand what the attraction is. And my assumption is, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, it'll be obvious that he's one of the foremost comic figures of our era. But I think that there's a lot more argument at this point because it's more difficult to see his work as separate from some of the just pale imitators who have come along. Is it more of a challenge or was it more of a challenge to write something, if not something new, because I don't know what new can be said, but to write something effectively and clearly and in, in a better way than has come before about someone like Charlie Chaplin or to as you just said, figure out who from the last 20 years should be included in this book. I mean, what's, what's a taller order, did you find? Yeah, it's, it's funny because they're, they're sort of two different tasks. And, you know, writing the book is all of a piece. And at the same time, it's, it's you know, writing the more recent entries were kind of entirely different as an experience than writing some of the older ones. You know, with someone like Chaplin, there's such an enormous amount of written material about him already. There's so much that's already been said. That part of the task is obviously saying something new, but part of it is also figuring out what of what's already been said is worth saying again or worth, you know, conveying in slightly different form. Uh, so in some senses, writing about some of these great figures is, a ta- is an editing task, and writing about some of the newer figures is really starting from the ground up. You know, there's... Obviously, there's been some material written about people like Ben Stiller or Will Ferrell. You know, you have newspaper profiles or articles in magazines, but not a ton that really takes their work seriously or has gone through it film by film and tried to figure out what the through line of their work is. So in that sense, it's almost like, uh, you know, cutting a new trail where one hasn't existed. And that's exciting in its own way in the sense of, sort of getting to be the first voice on a subject. Um, but, you know, both both are challenging. They're just challenging in, in very different ways. As a fan of American film comedy, did you begin with the older stuff and then move forward through time just in your own personal education about American film comedy? Or did you start with more whatever was most recent and then have to move backward? I mean, not even in terms of this book, but just in terms of what you liked and what direction that flowed. Yeah, probably more of the latter. You know, I, mm. I grew up in the 80s and 90s. So, you know, the, the sort of films of my childhood and, and you know, teenagerdom are stuff like Wayne's World. Uh, and those are the ones that kind of got me 
interested in comedy. So, you know, I would say that enjoying those films and sort of being fascinated by them encouraged me to be more interested in the films of the past. And then, you know, it's just sort of like anything else, educating yourself in the films of the past is such a haphazard kind of film by film experience where one film leads you to the next, you know, one book tells you what movies are worth checking out. And then, you know, it's a question of sort of investigating careers or directors or stars and and just kind of proceeding via hopscotch from one film to the next until all the gaps have sort of been plugged. But, you know, even now there's still lots of stuff that is probably worth checking out that I haven't actually gotten to and sort of half forgotten stars or directors in the past who um, were worth a second look. So even in working on this book, I, I ended up, um, you know, discovering for myself performers who I hadn't really been familiar with beforehand. People like, you know, uh, Harry Langdon, who was a silent star around the same time as Chaplin and Keaton, and just sort of being impressed at this whole other performer, um, you know, who I hadn't really known all that much about. In addition to the the cornucopia of short biographical entries at the end of the book, there's of course the thirty main chapters, each dealing with a performer or a writer or a or a director. And I want to get an idea: what was your process of determining who should make it into those long chapters? Who you absolutely had to include? I felt like for the most part it was pretty straightforward. Um, you know, once I knew that it was only going to be these thirty main chapters it seemed fairly obvious to me, at least, who should be included. There was some dithering on my part um, about the last couple. There were a couple of people who I had initially planned to include and then decided not to for various reasons. Uh, Really, the only challenging part was determining, you know, like we had talked about, determining the the contemporary figures. But there there were also a couple who fell by the wayside. I had been planning to include Mike Myers up front and then just, it didn't quite work out. I had also given some consideration to including Bob Hope, who I think is a really underrated comic figure and someone who people have weirdly mistaken assumptions about. But um, in some ways, I feel like I chose these 30 in particular because each of their stories fits together in a particular way. You know, one kind of influences the other and uh, you, you sort of see the path forged by American comedy through the way in which each performer, each director leads to the next. And I think the thing about Myers and Hope that didn't quite work out in particular was just that they didn't quite fit in. You know, they're they're both very interesting performers in their own right, but they didn't feel quite as organic to the story as as some of the other figures included. And with Mike Myers, arguably, and I, I guess I'll argue it, you can tell me what you think of it, that the arc of his career, at least that we know it thus far, it's kind of, it, it makes the same point or asks the same question as, uh, as Eddie Murphy's might, which is what, what went wrong, does it not? It does, although at the same time I would argue that it, when you look at most of the performers included in the book, who I think there would be you know, fairly little argument about their greatness or at least you know, their flashes of greatness. Um, comedic careers just don't last very long. Mm. It seems that inspiration is incredibly short-lived and it strikes unpredictably and then it goes away just as unpredictably. You know, so someone like Eddie Murphy, I think is an example that often comes to people's minds as being someone who, who was, you know, brilliant for a moment and then kind of has had this endless decline. Although I actually enjoy some of his later films, but to me, you know, that sort of pattern for a career is more the the rule than the exception. And the number of comedic figures who have long-lasting careers that extend beyond this, you know, five or six-year period are not that many. You know, you have people like Chaplin or Cary Grant uh, or, or Catherine Hepburn, but, you know, most most of the people in this book seem to fit that bill more than any other. And of course, you have a chapter on Woody Allen. And if we're talking about the fickleness of inspiration, is he is he an example of that or is he an exception to that? I would argue that he's more of an exception. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that definitely it would be fair to say that of his films of the last decade, let's say, 
Uh, most of them have not been quite at the level of his previous work. But you know, there, there seems to have always been this uh, theme of irrevocable decline in, in people writing about Woody Allen's work, <laughs> such that even when you read you know, articles about him from the 1980s, let's say, uh, there's already this sense that all of his best work is behind him. And, you know, I, I had already seen pretty much all of his films before starting on this book, but I watched them again and tried to watch them with a, a you know, relatively unblinkered eye. And to me, at least, uh, you know, he's doing very strong work until at least the late 1990s. Uh, and even some of the films that he's done more recently, I think, have been quite good. So I would argue that his style has obviously changed a tremendous amount. You know, I, I think a lot of fans are still hankering for Bananas or Sleeper Part 2, and that doesn't seem likely to recur. But, you know, the, the work he's doing in the 80s and even the 90s, I think, is is quite good. It's just different, and I think that a lot of his fans were not ever comfortable with the idea of him doing something so different from what he had initially started out as. And certainly he has struggled with making, you know, movies that are not obvious comedies many times throughout his career. And, you know, be, beginning early, I'm perhaps beginning with interiors and on forward. And it does make me, it makes me think of a, the balance between overt comedy and non-overt comedy or drama in someone's career. And then to look at the list of chapters here in your book, there there are some figures, I, I think of the Coen brothers or I think of Robert Altman, who are not, I would say, not even primarily known as comedic figures. Now, how did how did people like them, and there's even more in the short entries, make the cut? People not known as as pillars of comedy, but who nonetheless have produced works that have that have generated laughter. Well, it was important to me in particular to expand the balance of comedy to, to sort of make an argument that comedy is more than just clowns, uh, and so I, I intentionally included figures who were not, would not initially be thought of as comedic figures. So in the short entries, I include people like Alfred Hitchcock and Quentin Tarantino and John Wayne, you know, all of whom are associated with completely different genres, having very little to do with comedy. And yet, it, it was important to me to make it clear that in my mind, at least, you know, comedy uh, often extends beyond the bounds of, of um you know, something that's just broadly comic, and that filmmakers and, and performers um, working in other genres, especially in classical Hollywood, you know, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, um, are sort of managing to sneak in comedy in unexpected ways. So you have someone like John Wayne, who's, you know, obviously this paragon of the Western and of, you know, the war film. And yet, in a lot of those films in particular, uh, you know, in movies like The Quiet Man or The Wings of Eagles, he's very funny. He's a very gifted comic performer. He's very good at, at sort of, uh, you know, silly banter or slapstick humor. And, you know, the same with Hitchcock. You know, he's obviously the, the master of suspense, as people have it. But there, there are often times in his films where he does use humor as a sort of softening of some of the edges of, of his work. Um, so, you know, I wanted to argue that Comedy uh, is is often to be found in in set, you know in in sort of neighborhoods of the American film uh, where people wouldn't normally think to look, and that extends even into the modern era, where you have directors like Tarantino and Jim Jarmusch who are taken very seriously and you know are um, very intense filmmakers, and yet they they use humor in very specific ways. You know, so so that was sort of my intention, and in picking the cones and. Robert Altman for more consideration. I wanted to argue about them in particular, that they're both uh, essentially stealth humorists, that they use style in particular in a humorous way. So Altman is using his dialogue and the the the, the uh, overlapping dialogue style that he uses in which, you know, his characters are essentially talking over each other constantly uh, as a style of humor. Uh, and in some ways, I mean comedy less in the raucous laughter sense than in the sense of, you know, comedy versus tragedy, sort of a classical comedy uh, in the sense that in all films, no one's ever listening to anyone else. 
No one's ever paying attention to what anyone else is saying, and everyone's just talking and talking. And, and that, to me, was very classically comic. And, and the same with the cones, who I think are kind of um, the mad scientists of classic genre filmmaking. You know, they've clearly studied a great deal of what Hollywood has been capable of doing and kind of remixed and re-edited it and have spat it out in completely unpredictable ways in, in a sense that, you know, you look at a film like The Big Lebowski and it's basically a hard-boiled private eye film, you know, that, that Howard Hawks might have made with Humphrey Bogart and yet everything in it has gone completely warped and unpredictable <laughs> and, you know, other films and other genres seem to intrude on the style unpredictably. And, and so you have this kind of mashup of genres that to me is inherently comedic. If you've just tuned in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. My guest is cultural journalist Saul Austerlitz, author of Another Fine Mess, A History of American Film Comedy. When this show is over, you can listen to it again at colinmarshallradio.com or you can listen to any other program in the Marketplace of Ideas interview archive. Any questions, comments, feedback of whatever kind, do send that along to Colin, C-O-L-I-N at Colin Marshall Radio. Dot com. That's Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. And if you want to join the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list for weekly updates on current and upcoming interviews, as well as other related internet interestingness, send your email address along to Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. Once again, Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. Now back to the conversation with Saul Austerlitz on the Marketplace of Ideas, cultural conversation of the depth you demand. And what's more, with films like those of Jim Jarmusch, who we mentioned, or if we're talking about the Coen brothers, a movie like their most recent one, A Serious Man, I've laughed harder and more often at these films than I have at many out-and-out comedies. And I've wondered why that is. And it do, there does seem to be a certain a certain element of, as you said, looking or finding comedy where you don't expect to see it. And that contrast or that surprise makes that makes for me the comedy a lot richer and when it's when a film is announcing itself as this hilarious comedy defenses kind of go up right away i find and it 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 creates a bit of a burden to actually extract laughter not just from me but from certain other audiences as well it's kind of a a strange inverse law of comedy that i found holds true in my own watching do you find that it's ever true for you as well absolutely i think a serious man is a great example of a film where Audiences are so off kilter the entire time. Is it a tragedy? Is it a comedy? Is it a sentimental autobiography? You know, what is it? Uh, And the film never really gives us a a solid opportunity to get a grasp on where we stand. And I, I felt sort of uncomfortable the entire time, you know, never really knowing what is what is the style of this film? You know, what is it that we're supposed to be thinking about what's going on? And I think that definitely enhances the comedy. I think it enhances the seriousness of the film as well, ultimately. You know, I think that the ending of A Serious Man is one of the most mysterious and powerful I can remember seeing in a long time. But for the bulk of the film, I I find it incredibly funny, in part because they never really identify it as a straight-out comedy. You know, there is this sort of intrusion of other styles, other genres that's continually impinging on the narrative. Now, A Serious Man works with a few themes, a few themes to do with Judaism. And you mentioned in the beginning of the book, in the introduction, that there's, I, I believe you were talking about the, the sort of lack of women so far in, in, in American film comedy. And you mentioned the only minority that was overrepresented here was 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 Jewish people essentially and and British people and, and British people fair <laughs> enough and actually this this works this works well because my question here is Jewish people and British people they may be overrepresented in terms of numbers but to my mind they're also they're also the funniest I mean they they also they're they're also making the funniest comedy for my money and. I wonder because I'm because I neither come from any Jewish nor British traditions. It's not like I'm getting inside jokes that they're giving to me because of these things. They actually there just seems to be more funniness there. I mean, what's what is what is your take on on why this might be? Yeah, well, two comments. I mean, first of all, I'm I'm Jewish myself, so seeing a serious man was actually a very funny experience. I went to watch it in the theater with a friend of mine who's a rabbi, and um, 
we were both laughing hysterically at the movie, but we found something very interesting, which was that we were laughing at certain moments of the film. The rest of the audience was laughing at completely different moments of the film. <laughs> and uh, the two never really met up. There was just an entire series of sort of inside jokes or, or kind of humor that you'd only get if, if you kind of came from that milieu that I think might, you know, might have been missed by some other parts of the audience. But in terms of the, the bigger question of Jewish humor, I definitely think that there's something specific about Jewish comedy that has translated particularly well um, into film and into American filmmaking. And, you know, in some senses, I think that I, I do kind of want to reach towards a larger argument about it. But I, I also want to point out that one of the reasons why I think is because in some senses, the kind of farm system for Hollywood was so heavily Jewish. You know, a lot of the Jewish performers and even some of the non-Jewish performers who become these great uh, comedic figures uh, emerge out of vaudeville. You know, so you have people like the Marx Brothers who, who do an entire um, sort of training in vaudeville and on the stage before ever getting to, to Hollywood. You know, the Marx Brothers are already middle-aged by the time they make their first film. And I think that vaudeville and sort of the, the Jewish, particularly Jewish offshoots of vaudeville, like performances, performers in the Catskills, which you know both Woody Allen and uh, Jerry Lewis and Mel Brooks all got their start doing. I, I think that in some senses that was particularly excellent training for what being a comic movie star or a comic movie director required. Um, you know, I think there was a sense of just being able to move rapidly from one joke to the next, a sense of sort of franticness to the humor and an ability to understand what their audiences wanted. You, know, you, you read about um, Mel Brooks and he got his start as a teenager performing at Catskills hotels as a, a figure called a tumbler, which is basically like a freelance comedian who wandered the grounds of the hotel trying to entertain these um you know, middle-class Jewish vacationers who sort of felt like they were being ripped off, you know, and paying for their uh, hotel experience. And so he was meant to kind of make it up to them by being really funny. Um, and I think in doing something like that, which sounds incredibly daunting and difficult, uh, you learn very rapidly what people find funny, you know, what's going to amuse them and what's not. But I think that you know, in particular, that theatrical experience, which Jewish performers especially had, because so many of these institutions were primarily or exclusively Jewish, uh, it really gave some of these performers and, and future filmmakers a real leg up in some ways. And you also write about Ben Stiller in the book as as a craftsman of a certain type of Jewish comedy. But the interesting thing to me about that is I don't know how many people recognize that. Is Is he... Is there a sort of stealth Jewish comedy to Ben Stiller? I guess so. Although, I mean, his comedy is often pretty, you know, pretty open about its Jewishness in some ways. You know, you look at a film of his like Flirting with Disaster, and to me at least, it's clear that part of the joke, of, you know, part of what's so funny about it is that you have Stiller's figure who's so obviously Jewish and comes from this, you know, very neurotic Jewish household, uh, you know, where his parents are always sort of nagging at him. And he's going out and, you know, searching for his birth parents and, you know, is convinced almost instantaneously that he comes from this Finnish heritage. Uh, you know, it, to me, it's, it's <laughs> the ludicrousness of it is is, uh, is sort of obvious and, and is a, sort of a certain kind of self-mocking Jewish humor. And I want to touch as well on we mentioned these sort of British influences that have made inroads into American comedy. What, what can be said about what, what foreign sensibilities, what foreign country sensibilities have been able to offer American film comedy? Well, what's interesting, first of all, is that there doesn't seem to be a lot of connection between any other country besides Britain and American oh. humor. You know, so you have, there's obviously an, a whole wing of French film comedy in particular, or Italian film comedy. And, you know, while I don't think they're nearly as rich as American film comedy, there, there are a lot of wonderful performers who emerge from them. But there's very little sense in which their work is influenced by American comedians or that American comedians are influenced by them. So you have 
you know, someone like Shak Tati, who I think is brilliant. Um, there's very little connection between his work and American uh, filmmakers for the most extent. Whereas with British comedy and American comedy, they're much more delicately intertwined. And in part, I think that's uh, for obvious reasons, which is that, you know, Hollywood essentially steals the best British comedic performers like Chaplin or Cary Grant, like Peter Sellers, and basically makes them their own to the extent that I think a lot of people wouldn't entirely be aware that they even were British to begin with. But, you know, I, I think also it has something to do with having a, a sort of similar style of comedy to begin with. And and obviously, it, it's also that they grow up together in some ways. You know, so if, the, if Chaplin and Grant, who are the two, you know, two of the greatest American comedic performers of any era, are both really British, then, you know, that tells me something about the ways in which the two are, are really intertwined. It's fascinating because even today, and it happens less than it used to, but even today, for example, certain television series in England will be very successful and make everybody laugh over there on the other side of the pond, but will be regarded by the higher-ups here as, quote-unquote, too British to really play in America. And that makes me think that there's a certain... There's a certain commonality, a certain overlap of the Venn diagram. Perhaps there's some comedy that's too American for Britain, some comedy too British for America. But what is what is the piece, as far as we can tell, that that works with it works in both places? What what do they have in common? What really unites the traditions in terms of a sensibility? That's a really good question. I definitely think that the Venn diagram idea is is pretty spot on because it's clear to me that there are certain kinds of British humor. Um, which, you know, while, while they've become somewhat popular in the U.S., have never really translated to a mass audience. You know, I'm thinking of Monty Python or Faulty Towers or things like that. Um, whereas other aspects of British humor have really translated a lot better. I, I think in part it's the kinds of British humor that are less specifically British have managed to do better. You know, so someone like Peter Sellers is sort of this master of disguise, this person, you know, this man of a thousand voices. Um, Cary Grant is, you know, obviously has his own very distinct comic style, but one that isn't particularly British in a sense that Americans understand it. Um, so I, I think that the stuff that's more able to translate to American audiences is kind of the most generic. And I don't, I don't mean that in a disparaging way, but just in the sense that it's the least rooted in something specifically British that Americans just might not comprehend. So, you know, with looking at Chaplin as well, um, you know, and reading about some of the work he did on the vaudeville stage, you know, when he was traveling with, with the British vaudeville troupe, there's a sense in which some of that material seems to be particularly rooted in a kind of British humor, uh, although less than, than what some of his colleagues were doing at the same time. Um, and yet by the time he comes to the U.S., there's really very little sense that he's in any way not American. Know, that he's bringing anything that's distinctly foreign to the table. And I think that may have helped him kind of get across. And the same with Stan Laurel, who is also British, and Chaplin's understudy on the vaudeville stage. You don't have much sense that, that there's anything non-American about him. And I think that may ultimately have helped both of them with American audiences. You mentioned the the French comedy filmmaker Jacques Tati, and he comes up twice in your book, I believe, once in the chapter on Jerry Lewis and once in the Peter Sellers chapter. And you also mentioned a movie in there that I happened to watch, have watched myself the other day, Playtime, the third of the uh, Monsieur Hulot movies, all of which I love. And I was watching this film, Playtime, and trying to think what distinguishes, if, if, I, if I hold it up as an example of French comedy, what distinguishes it from American comedy? And earlier that day, I happened to watch Preston Sturge's Sullivan's Travels, and I couldn't find a lot in common between those two movies, other than that I was laughing at both of them uh, about equal, in equal amounts, really. I mean, Tati's movies are less ha-ha funny than sort of like a sort of ingeniously funny, but I was wondering that, you know, a, a guy like Jacques Tati, watching his films, what does that... What does that give you in terms of throwing into contrast what makes American comedy so American? I mean, I guess by what they don't have in common, other than that they're both laughter generators. Yeah, I think that Tati's work is particularly fascinating as a contrast because, 
it's just it's such a remarkable symbol of a kind of comedy that other people haven't really pursued in any way. So there's very little dialogue in most Satie films. A lot of the humor is very observational in the sense that um, he's often making jokes about modernity, you know, so about malfunctioning technology or about some of the uh, oddities of the contemporary world. But it's all very subtly done. Um, it's humor of a kind that if you're not really paying close attention to the film, you might miss all of the jokes, really all of them, and just <laughs> be left with nothing. I, I mean, I love Tati. Tati is one of my all-time favorites, but it's very much not an American style. Um, so you, you mentioned that I had included him a few times in the book, and one of the places where I mention him is this very, this very odd one-off film that uh, Peter Sellers and Blake Edwards, who had directed Sellers in some of the Pink Panther movies um, did together in the late 1960s called The Party, where Sellers plays this kind of Tati-esque figure who wreaks havoc on a, uh, a swanky party. And the film is very much like Tati in the sense that there's almost no dialogue and all the humor is um, sort of observational and physical. And it's not quite at the level of playtime. It's not quite at the level of Tati's best work by any stretch of the imagination. But it is sort of this remarkable oddity in the sense that it's an American version of Tati. And really, it's the only time or the only major time that I can think of where you can see that influence being played out in a, in a Hollywood fashion. And played out, I can't help but notice, by an Englishman as well in that role. An Englishman playing an Indian character. So <laughs> yes. There's sort of this double foreignness to to uh, to the the main character in this film. With the with the sort of immersion, or not sort of, with the huge immersion in American film comedy you have to undergo to write a book like this. What stood out to you as American comedy filmmakers' great strengths, to the extent that they have strengths in common? You know, it varies performer to performer and director to director, but I would say that the American com one of the American comedy's greatest strengths is just its phenomenal capacity for uh, for a great dialogue. You know, you look at the great uh, directors of the early sound era, people like Lubitsch or Sturgis, you know, or Howard Hawks, and they have this remarkable overload of brilliant dialogue. Um, you know, just sort of running endlessly. And um, I found, at least in my own watching, that the thing that American comedy does best often is its ability to be irreverent and fresh and funny and ludicrous all at once. Um, and that's something that's never really gone away. And on the other hand, you obviously have this remarkable tradition of brilliant physical comedy. You know, so you can kind of trace the lineage from someone like W.C. Fields to Jerry Lewis to Eddie Murphy to Will Ferrell, you know, this sort of legacy of brilliant clowns who are, you know, who are in some senses are much better at, um, at conveying their comedy through the use of their body than they are in, in, you know, in the dialogue itself, which is not always incredibly memorable. On the flip side of that, are there any, are there any qualities of comedy you find you have to go to a non-American country for certain, certain, certain things American comedy just never specialized in? You know, I think that people who particularly enjoy a certain brand of incredibly quirky comedy uh, often find themselves turning to British comedy, which seems to be much more immersed in, uh, in that kind of oddity for its own sake. Uh, I don't think that American film, or at least mainstream American film, has ever really gotten the hang of that to quite the same extent. Um, so I would say that that's something that's probably more to be found elsewhere. And with the particularly strong creators of film you talk about in the book, one of the, one of the things I find in comedy or not in comedy in terms of filmmaking is that if something is, if a film is good, by definition, it's a film I'm going to be able to come back to over and over and over and over again. Comedies I found in general, I've had a little more trouble with that because some comedies, perhaps lesser comedies, 
are built to surprise the first time around, but they can't rely on that the next time around. Do you find with the with the true greats that they somehow get past that element of comedy where they, they, they transcend the sort of they transcend the fact that a joke told twice is not that funny if the joke is run of the mill? I think they do to some extent. You know, I think what you're describing is clearly true. There's something about comedy in particular, like, you know, a horror film, perhaps, where part of the wonder of it is the element of surprise, the sense that you haven't seen it before. By the time you see it a second time, you already know the joke. um, And it isn't quite as fresh as it was. But, you know, for me, looking at someone like Will Ferrell, you know, even if I'm watching Anchorman for the fifth or tenth time, and I already know what all the jokes are going to be, there's still something wonderful about the precise way in which they unfold, or the precise way in which Will Ferrell does whatever it is he does um, that makes it exciting for me, even if I already know what's going to happen. And there's another sort of league of modern American filmmakers that we alluded to at the beginning of this conversation. And I mean, I'll use as an emblem, one of my favorite working filmmakers today, Wes Anderson. And with him, his films are constructed in such a way, the films don't care if you know the joke or not, do they? Well, the, the other amazing thing about Wes Anderson is also that his films are so beautifully constructed and so dense that oftentimes I'll find that it won't be till the third or fourth time that I'm watching one of his films that I even notice some of the details. You know, so he's, he's really overstuffed his films with so much material, um, you know, of varying kinds, you know, comic and tragic and just observational, that uh, it, it often doesn't even come through on a first viewing. You, you find yourself just following the narrative and missing a lot of the fleeting details that are in some ways, ultimately at the heart of his work. And I want to know, who in American film comedy, or or even just in any kind of American comedy, who, when you hear they're working on something new, do you get very excited about? I mean, who can still, after, after writing a whole book on American film comedy, who can still really raise your interest and really sort of, in, really get across the notion that I'm going to create something reliably really funny and really rich. Is there anybody who, for you, is consistent about that today? You know, I don't know about consistent. I don't think anyone is you know, always going to be dependable uh. in terms of delivering something brilliant. I would say that the Coen brothers very rarely do anything that's not, at the very least, extremely interesting. Um, I'm very curious about True Grit, which... I just oh, yes. don't really know what to make of them remaking this sort of mediocre John Wayne Oscar winner from the 1960s. Um, but they clearly have something in mind, and I just don't know what it is. So that's definitely stoked my curiosity to see it. <laughs> I think that Judd Apatow has been consistently fascinating, uh, even though his last film, Funny People, was didn't quite hit the target and sort of wanders off into a weird tangent. Um, I thought it was a a fascinating effort, even though it didn't entirely work. And so I I would, you know, I I would say that those are the two figures that come to mind as being the ones who I'm always going to be interested to see what they do next. And, and, you know, like we've talked about, Wes Anderson also is just someone who can really do no wrong in my book. And the fact that he can make an animated film sort of intended for children and still have it be unquestionably a Wes Anderson film from the very first frame is remarkable to me. And I'd be very curious to see where he goes from Fantastic Mr. Fox. And finally, when someone says, okay, I'm down with Judd Apatow, I'm down with Will Ferrell, I'm down with the Coen brothers, I'm down with Wes Anderson, but older stuff, older comedy is confusing to me. And let's say they've even read your book, but they they can't be sure how to back into the older stuff, shall we say. What do you tell them? Well, I always have a couple of suggestions of films that I think are so magnificent that I'd be hard-pressed to imagine that anyone couldn't find a way to enjoy them. Um, I often suggest the Preston Sturgis film, The Lady Eve, which isn't even necessarily his absolute best film. I would probably say that Sullivan's Travels is his best, but it's so buoyant and witty and 
endlessly entertaining as a comedy. Um, but I think it's a great introduction to the wonders of screwball comedy, which is in some ways the best thing that Hollywood has ever done. I also often try to direct people to Ernst Lubitsch's film, The Shop Around the Corner, which you know was remade about 10 years ago as You've Got Mail, but the original is obviously far superior and is just funny and bittersweet and a little bit tragic and wonderfully human and in some ways just an absolutely perfect film uh, and a really brilliant introduction to what Hollywood could do when it put its mind to it, you know, what the, what the system was capable of accomplishing. The book, once again, is Another Fine Mess, A History of American Film Comedy. Saul, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the program today. Thanks very much. If you'd like to learn more about Saul Austerlitz and Another Fine Mess, visit SaulAusterlitz.com. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I've been Colin Marshall. You can hear the show again at ColinMarshallRadio.com or on iTunes. Just search for the Marketplace of Ideas in the iTunes store and get the complete archives completely free. Any questions, comments, feedback, send it along to Colin, C-O-L-I-N at ColinMarshallRadio.com. Or if you want to join the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list, do send your preferred email address there. The website of Ben Althaus, the man who makes our theme music, is available at BenAlthaus.com. And thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you next time on the Marketplace of Ideas, cultural conversation of the depth you demand. <laughs>